Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crumby Radio while we're on Saga 960. I was at a real estate uh, forum conference in Edmonton recently, and a, a guy, a gentleman came up on stage who is uh, an expert in technology, and he really wowed me uh, with a lot of the things he said about uh, technology, about uh, Edmonton, about uh, uh, AI, uh, and I, I wanted to reach out to him and get him on the show because I really think he's got a lot of insight that uh, that should be shared. And so I want to introduce you tonight to Corey Jensen. He is the co-founder, co-CEO of Alta MI, a Canadian artificial intelligence scale-up that designs, implements applied AI solutions for business. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So Corey, uh, tell me a little bit about yourself uh, and and about uh, uh, you know Alta ML I uh, ML uh, if you could yeah, Alta ML yeah well, well this this was an accidental business I we in my past history I, I founded a financial website uh, co-founded by Invest called Investopedia and so it sold that to Forbes in the late two thousands and and my partner Nicole and I really weren't planning on getting back in the startup game. But all this buzz you see around generative AI now, I'm sure we're going to talk about that in, you know, in the next you know, 10, Probably. 20 minutes. Here. Yep. Uh, the, you know, we were actually trying to do that six or seven years ago. So we approached some academics at the U of A. Now, we were a few years ahead where the technology was and maybe a few hundred million dollars off in terms of uh, the budget that's required in terms of to actually make this work. Uh, but our project that we were calling algorithmic content generation, I mean, maybe we're ahead of the time, maybe we just had the timing wrong, uh, but was a massively failed project. Um, but two things came out of it. Number one, we learned more about the Canadian AI ecosystem, which many Canadians don't realize how Canada punches way above its weight class really? when it comes to AI. So you hear deep learning these terms like most most of the big advancements are, are using a tech a, a branch of ai called deep learning that was invented right here in canada at the in toronto and montreal jeffrey hinton at the u of t yan lacoon and joshia yoshio bengio in montreal they i mean they won the nobel prize for it what what is deep learning so, so deep learning think of it, it it's it's a branch of um, it for those technical listeners, I understand this isn't going to be exactly correct, but the way the average listener should think of this is just using um, massive amounts of data, it roughly modeled after the same way your brain works. So artificial neural networks, you're trying to create these neural networks, which basically you're, you're getting to higher level of abstraction, but it, it's a branch of machine learning. Think of machine learning as uh as building software that can adapt without being explicitly programmed. So in other words, we have a big data set. We kind of throw it a bunch of, at a bunch of computer code, and we're looking for patterns within that data. Again, that's technically not exact. That's not how the data scientist would describe it. But for the average listener, just understand that it's a different type of programming. You know, beforehand, if you had the rules, you just automated something by, you know, you know getting some programmers together and building that. Yep. Now we're using data and a special type of code to be able to actually make better predictions. And so these guys, these these individuals, these scientists uh, uh, got the Nobel uh, Prize. Um, have they been doing more stuff in AI since then? Well, this and this is the classic Canadian uh, story. So so uh, in, in central Canada, you had deep learning. And then out west, where I'm from in Alberta, in Edmonton, uh, was a guy by the name of Dr. Richard Sutton, who literally wrote the book on another branch of AI called reinforcement learning. So just think of all these terms as, a, at the end of the day, we're all, we're trying to build the software making predictions. It really doesn't matter for your listeners in terms of the exact technical side of it. Just know that there's been these breakthroughs, and Canadians have actually been at the forefront of it. Except, and here's the big gotcha, in classic Canadian fashion, we're really good about doing all the work and letting the Americans get the credit. Happens all the time in pharmaceuticals. Happens all the time in a variety of areas. We we do amazing research and then do not necessarily have the same commercialization chops that our good friends from down south have. So if you actually look at it, it's a Yoshia Bengio. Uh, well, Bengio has kind of been on his own, but uh, Yan Lacuna's Facebook, Jeffrey Hinton up until just last week was Google. And then as well, uh, up until just recently as well, Richard Sutton was Google as well. So the Americans basically came in and hired some of our best people um, because frankly, they were, they, they're absolute world leaders in terms of the, the thought process for, for this new generation of technology. 
So is losing that talent to the United States what motivated you to start the company? Well, not so much. And 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 for clarity, they're all still here in Canada. Uh, Yan Lacoon might not be up, uh, but they're 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 physically here. I'm just saying that that it's actually caught, created a bunch of investment from from big tech coming in. But what we saw is that as we had this failed project, we were blown away by the talent at at the University of Alberta, and we're saying if we have this much problem getting commercialization to work as a small nimble tech company, then what do the RBCs and Suncores, the, the large enterprises of, of the country, how are they supposed to lean into this? Because the talent is still very unevenly distributed. It's mostly, you know, big tech in the Valley has no problem, but, it, you know, it, it's better, a little bit better today, but still very much in academia. And so that was really the inspiration for building AltML. So uh, what that's evolved into over the last five years is, is AltML is a venture studio. So we build AI solutions, software, and companies. Think of us as having two sides of the business. On one side, we're a company builder, like an early stage VC, kind of like an incubator that'll kind of build companies onto it. But our edge, our differentiator is that we'll go and build corporate AI labs um, with very large organizations where we, we co-develop together. See, the reason for that is that the problem in AI is that if you don't have any data, it's pretty tough to build AI software. And most of the data exists within big or large organizations, right. both corporate and government. So by going in and building these labs together, it's almost, at, you know, we can build solutions and help, help our corporate partners, um, you know, achieve better processes within the organization. And every once in a while, we see something that says, hey, you know what, let us invest with you. So we're almost like that early stage venture capitalist that's coming in looking for ideas in AI. When did you launch uh, Alta ML? Back in 2018. So really, just... so you really saw this whole uh, move to AI before the world uh, really, you know, jumped onto it. Well, and 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 Canada's been at the forefront. I mean, we weren't we weren't necessarily the first. There was certainly been a, a ton of companies in Quebec uh, and and Ontario uh, that have were, were also have, um, we, we have an AI industry here in this country, um, and it, it so this. Chat GPT and all this buzz you're seeing today, it it's been around for a while. It, it's gr it's great because all the stuff that we've been working on for the last few years now all of a sudden it's you know I'm doing my air quotes here of new, um, but frankly these amazing researchers have been doing it for twenty plus years, and even you know dumb entrepreneurs like me we've been at this for you know five or six or seven years. And now all of a sudden we've got this, uh, you know, over the last few months here, you, you know, we've, we, we finally got the public realizing executives, policymakers and the public realizing, Hey, this is going to change everything. Well, and uh, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, we had 50 top, uh, uh, you know, people in this uh, industry write a big letter about taking a pause. Uh, the, the open letter that they put in the newspapers and uh, sent to, you know, universities and parliaments and legislatures and Congress and stuff like that. And then uh, just today, you may have seen in the Economist magazine, uh, you know, social anthropologist, uh, uh, I'm going to pronounce this name wrong, Yervol Nori Harari, who's written that book, uh, Sapiens and Homo Deus, came out and said that this could change humanity uh, for the bad. And we had to take a we had to take a break and think about it. Anyway, we're going to take a break ourselves uh, for some messages and be back in just two minutes with Corey Jensen talking about his company Alta ML and about uh, artificial intelligence and uh, about uh, ChatGPT and about uh, generative uh, AI, etc. Stay with us, everyone. This is going to be a really interesting conversation tonight. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio while we're on Saga 960. My guest tonight is Corey Jensen. He is the co-founder, co-CEO of Alta ML, a leading artificial intelligence scale-up that designs and implements applied AI solutions for businesses. Corey drives Alta ML's growth strategy and actively helps business leaders understand how implementing AI can be a horizontal enabler to create a competitive advantage. He's been involved in successful, several successful ventures and is best known for co-founding and growing Investopedia.com, which was sold to Forbes Media in 2007. Corey is active in the Alberta entrepreneurial ecosystem and is a member of the Business Council of Alberta. Uh, he is also a past president of the Edmonton Entrepreneurs Organization, a director at uh, Vertical Scope, uh, which is uh, traded on the TSX, 
and McCoy Global, and he sits on several private company advisory boards. I had the pleasure of hearing him at a, a recent real estate uh, forum in Edmonton, and he was provocative, uh, and he was uh, he got everyone to sit up and think, uh, and that's what a good uh, lunchtime speaker should do. And you uh, you 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 raised everyone's attention to a bunch of issues, uh, some political actually as well. Uh, which we might address, but also about uh, the power of uh, of the ecosystem, the power of innovation, the power of AI. Uh, so thank you uh, for that, Corey. I appreciate it. And I appreciate you chatting with us uh, tonight. Tell me, what, what's happening at your company, Alta ML, right now that you're most excited for? Oh, you know, we get to see so many machine learning use cases. Uh, I, I think that the, the thing that's most exciting, the common theme amongst all of them is this, this move towards responsible AI. And, you know, you alluded to that letter that, that was brought out a few years, a few months ago in terms of taking a pause. Um, and there is some big debate amongst those in, in the industry about this, like, is it even possible to take a pause? Is it, but there's one thing we were signatory to a letter here in Canada that, that is that we actually do need regulation. Now that that might seem funny, having a tech industry actually wanting to be regulated, um, but you know we don't put a drug out on the market without it being first tested, you know, on humans. We don't necessarily you know release a new car without crash tests. And so there, over time, as the industry matures, there will be something along that line that I think we can put in place, you know, reasonable precautions to make sure that that this this technology that has profound implications on so many aspects of our life that is done in a safe and ethical manner. And we think that actually Canada can play a major role in this whole area of responsible AI. So the Americans and the Chinese are going to be the best in the world at AI. You, you can't catch them. It's, it's a two horse race. You know, but be before the break, we were talking about how Canada has been a real leader, especially from the academic side and more and more so on the commercial side. There's some real bright spots there. But when you think about brand Canada, when you think about how we're, you know, respected and, and I dare say even say, you know, loved around the world or at least not hated. You know, there's a real opportunity for us to take a leadership role in making sure the governance for building AI systems has that ethical and responsible lens. So what most people don't think about is that an AI solution is just built upon the data that's fed into it. So if there's bias in that data, and I think we would all acknowledge that there's bias in almost every part of society in one way or another, right? If you feed in biased data, you will exacerbate and accentuate that bias. So we got to scrub the data before it's put in. Uh, it, it, it's more than scrub. I mean, you've got to be thinking. It, it's 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 not just a matter of scrubbing. It's not like an arbitrary process. It's, it's actually putting some critical thinking into saying, okay, are we understanding the data? So yes, scrubbing and cleaning and normalizing and making sure that, but I'm making sure that we're saying if there's biases past and we're training these models based upon on this past data are we are we continuing that in the future if we're going to use this tool so for example let's say you had um you know one most common ai applications would be a, you know a mortgage application or an application a credit application for some form of debt and i'm just saying for in theory let's say that the that there was some bias that you know certain loan officers were using, maybe you know based upon you know certain certain groups in society. You're going to capture that, and I'm not this. I'm not pointing fingers at any banks. I'm just we're talking in the theory here. Right, understood. If you did have that, and you were training data based upon that, and say you had these hundreds of variables, these thousands of variables that you're training AI models on, you really need to understand how those decisions were made in the past, how we're training data on it, because that bias will continue and actually be accentuated in that model going forward. And, and so responsibly, that's one example of bias where- You know, it's interesting. I, I, systems... just, with, just before I chatted with you, I was chatting with a recruitment specialist and uh, she was saying that 65% of all resumes are, are reviewed by AI first. And, and I'll tell you what, women- describe themselves differently than men do 
in those resumes. And this is not subjective. I'm happy to send the academic literature around of it. And, and so if you train on, you know, if you've got a bunch, of, it, and it is a male dominated field. So if you're training based upon engineers that have been hired, and this is a great example where let's say in theory, there's some bias in hiring, I think, <laughs> you know, not a stretch, then then if you're keying on certain elements, so you know it's subjective. What is what is good? What is not? And if we're just using those past hires as the ground truth, well, it, this opens up a whole can of worms. Yeah. And so the point here is that there's a whole field around looking at this, and this is where Canada can play a role. And we've basically bet our company on everything we do needs to have a a, a, a responsible AI lens to it. It's like it's like baking a cake. Let's say, you know, you mix it up and you, you know, you put in the eggs and you get the flour and the sugar and you, you put the cake in the oven, put it, you can't just put on a layer of responsible icing on top. That's not going to work. The cake's already baked. So you can't just take these models afterwards and just say, okay, we think that these are going to be ethical. You know, it involves the ingredients and the process right from the beginning. Okay. But how do you, how do you do that? You know, I've heard these comments. I can't remember the the, the word, but uh, that that ChatGPT and other uh, um, uh, large language uh, um, large vehicles. Large language models, LLMs, large language models. Large Not language. With the legal acronym, because a lot of lawyers, <laughs> well, it's an LLM, you know, no, it's a large language. ChatGPT is a type of large language model. Okay, these large language models, um, if they've got, they, they can they can be very persuasive and confident about something that's wrong. Well, uh, you know what's interesting there, Brett? Brian, you used the word confident for an AI model. Isn't that interesting? Confident. How does it exude confidence? By the way it talks. I, you know, and, and you're not the first one to use that term, but I, I find that fascinating. And and so here's the biggest thing. And 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 if if your listeners hear nothing else other than this, understand that at this point, tre- out of the box, large language models, like ChatGPT, has no idea if what it's saying is true. Because it's just copying what it sees and reads more stuff and in the it, in all the data files it's got. It, it's this gigantic generalization and summarization machine. Now, it it is absolutely amazing. I'm not trying to take away from it. Large language models are going to change every industry. And uh, I mean, we've been working with them for years and and, and now see uh, even more opportunity because of all of this, this buzz around chat GPT. But what it means is if you're writing, so let's say you're saying, hey, chat GPT or any other LLM, and, and you're getting it to write a, a first draft of a memo. Okay, well, you're still involved, you're still, a data scientist would call you the human in the loop, right? And you're still looking at that and saying, okay, well, this is right and this is wrong, but it saved you a whole bunch of time when you put that together. Now, that's different than, let's say you're a lawyer asking a large language model about a specific judgment or, at, you know, trying to put together a brief for a, a, a legal brief. And there, accuracy really matters. And so what you actually need to do is, is, is you need to make sure you can still use these technologies, you can still use these large language models, but they need to be able to point back to a source of the truth in some way. One of our spinoff companies, it's, it's called Jurisage, is actually doing just this. We've acquired the largest independent corpus of Canadian case law, and we're using that to, and we're using um, ML um, uh, to be able to understand the elements of a court case. And from that, we're optimizing the legal research process. But again, we're not training it on the overall internet. Or I mean, essentially what ChatGPT is, ChatGPT and Bard and Amos, they're basically trained on, on trillions of parameters, on, of variables. So they're basically trained on all the data that exists out there publicly. And a Good whole data bunch of and bad data. Garbage well, in, garbage out. It, hey, is there, any, is there any bias on the internet? Well, none. No conspiracy <laughs> theories, no bias, no opinions, nothing. Right? No, no. Listen, it's you can easily argue and say, "Well, this is this is this is no different than going on a Facebook or any other social network." It's just as me as as biased. True, but I think you hit it. You know, when you when you go and do a Google search and there's ten sites, you kind of understand that there's a difference between the Globe and Mail and Joe's blog. 
and maybe you hate the Globe and Mail or maybe you like because you like the National Post or vice versa. It doesn't really matter. The point is that you you understand that that media provides value to society. Well, there's a whole bunch of people that uh, believe that Fox, uh, um, CNN, uh, you know, CNBC, um, MSNBC are are. our news organizations. And recently someone came out with a $780 million uh, uh, finding that one of them may be more entertainment than it is actual news. Well, well yeah. Hey, and, and let's keep this Canadian. I agree. Listen, we, 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 we need a beer for that conversation to talk about the dominion lawsuit. And that, but you know, it, if one were to actually accept the argument that there's some value in independent journalism and that work, I, I like call me crazy um, that, that you, you at least understand the voice and where it's coming from. Something coming from the National Post or the Globe and Mail, you might view with a different angle, good or bad, than Joe's blog. And, and so I think the point here is that knowing the sources for a large language model, when you ask that question, it comes back with such confidence. How do we make sure that our kids realize that it's not necessarily true? You can't necessarily take that just out of the box and just believe that as the gospel. And and to to OpenAI's defense, if you look at at the bottom of ChatGPT and everything says, hey, ChatGPT might not know, uh, you know, f- uh, facts, places, people, you know, like they've disclaimed this. But I've done a lot of ChatGPT one on ones in the last few months, and I look as I look into the audiences and I and I share that. I said, you might already know this, and then I look in their faces; they don't know. The vast majority of people have no idea that these new how these large language models are constructed and the risk that comes from them. So I would propose that there's actually far less risk of robots and the terminators and that, that whole, you know, apocalyptic scenario versus the spread of disinformation that destroys our democracy. We should be very worried about that. The spread of disinformation, the spread of disinformation that destroys our democracy. Now that's a pretty profound statement. You're worried about this because what chat GPT is going to spread this disinformation. Uh, and I, I do not want to talk to the lawyers for OpenAI afterwards. I'm not saying this about ChatGPT. I'm talking for clarity about this type of technology of large language models, of which ChatGPT is becoming the brand name that people understand. So ChatGPT will put in a bunch of safeguards, has put in a bunch of safeguards, as has Google with their product and BARD, right? It, but there's dozens of other large language models that are out there. Many that are completely open source, like Facebook released their entire model. So it's out there in the wild. And so you could easily take some of those other large language models that have no safeguards and nothing. And to be able to, when you think about how you can create, um, you know, you used to have to hire legions of people to write mis, you know, propaganda or misinformation. Think about the power that you have in these tools that I mean for good and for evil, like any technology, this is a double-edged sword. Okay, but how do we how do we possibly regulate it and and decide what is right when we can't decide whether you know vaccines are right or wrong, whether climate change is real or not? You know, think about some of the big arguments that we've got. There are people that honestly believe two sides of uh, of the point of view, even when ninety seven percent of scientists agree something or other. There's a bunch of people in the three percent on the other side that uh, would argue the opposite. So how do you actually? Yeah, you, know, you think about Twitter and all the different points of view on Twitter. You think about whether Joe Biden won the election uh, three years ago to go back to an American uh, you know, comment. So how do you actually have a regulator that decides what's actually right versus what's wrong? Well, and... Is and it majority rules? <laughs> majority so, chooses the truth? So, so I, I, I'm not here as a benevolent dictator trying to give you all the answers in terms of it. I'm highlighting where, you know, we started talking about what I'm most excited about with, with, with AltML. And I'd say it's a focus on, 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 on responsible AI and how then broadly Canada can be a leader in this space. So what you're asking here are extremely difficult questions. Given that we have this deep expertise in artificial uh, intelligence, machine learning in this country, and given we've got brand Canada, this is the the problem. This is the mega problem that we could and should take on. Because we're not going to, you know, I can give you a couple opinions in this and then there's a robot. Like you've highlighted the issue completely. 
And I don't think it's a matter of just turning over to a regulator to dictate what to do, but to create those governance frameworks so that we know that as we're consuming these applications in the future, that they have um, that 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 there's some rigor involved in their creation. Like you, you wouldn't take a drug necessarily without if blind faith, without knowing that Health Canada has had some system around that, right? And so I, I think that we're going to see AI as an industry over the next few years evolve, and you'll see more safeguards put in place, or some maybe some regulation, but even more importantly, a governance framework that 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 helps to solve some of these problems so that we're not living in some dystopian future where we have no idea of what is true or not, or even maybe an even worse situation, because some would argue maybe we're already living there. Well, you know, I, I was just going to say that, uh, uh, you know, I agree with your Health Canada analogy, but lots of people disagreed with what the FDA did. We had a, a court case recently in Texas where they threw out what uh, the FDA decided on a on a, an abortion uh, drug, uh, you know, 10, 20 years ago. And uh, just last night, uh, Ron DeSantis had, uh, as the keynote speaker to graduation ceremony, a doctor that Trump appointed to the vaccine thing that didn't believe in vaccines and told everyone that we needed to have herd immunity. So, you know what? There are different truths in this world. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, wasn't it a communications expert for Trudeau that said, for, for Trump that said, uh, that was a Freudian slip, that for Trump that said uh, there's some, you know, some people's truths and other people's truths. Uh, we're having an interesting conversation with Corey Jensen tonight. We're going to take a break for some messages. We're going to try to calm it down. And we're going to come back to what his company is doing and what we can do in Canada. Stay with us, everyone. Back in two minutes. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I'm chatting tonight with Corey Jensen. He is the co-founder, co-CEO of Alta ML, a, car a Canadian artificial intelligence scale-up that designs and implements applied AI solutions for businesses. And the way I'm, I'm sort of understanding it is you're almost like a VC company or a incubator and you uh, you invest in a bunch of different uh, AI opportunities and then you partner up some of those with actually large companies to get access to their data. Uh, sounds like a really fascinating business model and you must, because of that, get exposed to a lot of what's going on in the industry. And so you probably really are the, uh, the expert that... Uh, that I and lots of people wanted to talk about. Um, you, I understand, have just uh, gone into a market entry into the United States. Tell me what what's happening there and what you're excited about in that regard. Yeah, we, we, we've definitely we've been pushing over as we've come out of the pandemic, um, been pushing down at the U.S. and uh, you know we've we, we we have we're active in both Alberta and Ontario, uh, but given our Albertan roots, as you can imagine, there's. Um, there, there's a lot of, of use cases around sustainability and it, you know and the the future of energy that the natural the natural stepping point for us is from Calgary to Houston and so man, it we will never meet any climate goals without using software to optimize industrial processes and I think part of part of the exciting story that's uh, and I will say that, the Americans are way ahead of us. Like we're, we're playing this catch up game. Like when I'm sitting on the ground in Houston, all their talk, you know, this is front and center. And so how we use data to, um, to optimize um, existing means of production, you know, uh, and thus reducing carbon or inventing brand new processes is, is a big part of that move. And so, uh, yeah, we're going to be betting, um, you know, big on, on, on how we can actually, you know, make more inroads into Texas. And then, and then the second areas on the health side, uh, more on the East coast, kind of the Boston area, uh, you know, as much as I think we're, we're, we're proud of, of the nascent sort of life sciences industry here in Canada. Um, and we've got, to, we should actually talk about health because there's so much potential we have because of our system in Canada to be able to build AI applications here. Um, but a lot of that's been driven by better connections and, and sources of capital there. So what you're saying that in health we have a, a big opportunity, but we're we're losing it because of a lack of capital. Well, okay, capital is certainly one. I mean, across the board, you'd say. I mean, and and the capital has improved dramatically over the last few years in terms of venture in Canada, um, but we're still way behind the U.S. Um, so I, I'd say there's some bright spots there. Um, I'll give you an example from my home province of Alberta. So unlike Ontario, we have one health authority in Alberta. So. You know, we're much smaller, you know, there's only four and a half million people, but that's all under one health authority. So in theory, on paper, we should be the best, one of the best places in the world to actually build AI applications. 
because you've got a diverse population, four and a half million people, all basically one big gigantic database. It's not quite that way, but think of it that way. So if there were the political will to actually be able to get access to that, you could create a new multi-billion dollar industry right here in Canada. It's really hard to get access to that data though, right? And, and, and even as I'm saying this, I know your listeners are probably going, I don't want any dumb nerd accessing my health data. Um, but, and here's where we come back to the responsible AI and the education. No AI scientist wants to know your name or, or really to connect that to you personally. But we do want to be able to use data to increase, to improve diagnosis, to be able to improve tra- treatment pathways, you know, in addition to being able to create new precision drugs that can help you that are built around your body. The biology and data are on this collision course, and we're going to see breakthroughs over the next decade that are like absolute science fiction. And we've got all the fundamental building blocks here. We just need to get more capital at it and 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 really kind of build that right governance framework so we can have coordination between post-secondaries, you know, the public sector and this new ecosystem. So I used to be involved in the medical device and pharmaceutical field. So I understand where you're coming from. Um, and as long as you can ensure people the privacy, uh, the yeah. confidentiality uh, that you've described, there is a huge amount of benefit. And, you know, one of the, the best examples is radiologists that are beaten by AI systems on diagnosing, you know, uh, ultrasound, MRI, et cetera, uh, um, results uh, far better, far quicker, uh, far more effective in finding cancers and things like that. For, for some use cases. So you're correct, but the edge cases, the, per, the, the radiologist, the clinician is still better. So the clinician who, here's where, here's what it's going to be in healthcare. AI will not replace doctors. Doctors who use AI will replace those who don't. That's a key differentiator. Radio- radiologists are not going the way of the dodo. First of all, who's going to sign on that liability? Who's going to take the liability for telling your mom she's got cancer or doesn't? Is Google or is Google or big tech going to do that? I don't think so. Right. So there is a real need for the medical professionals we have, and it needs to be a partnership with those medical professionals. But that 30 year old radiologist that's coming up that's using AI as part of it is going to be many times faster. It's going to be more accurate and is going to be so superior in every single way. And and what's cool is you can take this from health and you can play that to law. You can play that to accounting almost anywhere as a pro- professional. There's so much fear. And I, and, and yes, some jobs will be changed or displaced, but in many of them, it's going to be situations where you're using these tools. It, it's like you've received, a, a, you know, you were working with a screwdriver before. Now you've got a power drill. That's what AI is to a professional. A power drill. Give me an example, a specific example of how your AI technology has helped a specific client or industry. Sure. I'll give you two examples that I'm, I'm I'm proud of. One, we're working as I'm, and it's as front of center because uh, 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 you, you picture looking out to uh, almost like it feels like I'm looking out to smog in LA as I'm sitting here in Edmonton on on this uh, at time of taping. We're we're covered in smoke from the wildfires. Well, we've been working with the province of Alberta um, on their pre suppression unit to actually predict where wildfires will ta- will occur in the province. So this is actually a very big issue in terms of the amount of money that we spend and where equipment is put. Um, and, and so we're by being able to predict where in the province a fire is happening, um, there's, a, there's actually a massive economic cost or, or, or savings in the s- seven figures. But then you talk about the reduction in carbon and, and just reduction in, in you know, human life and, and that risk there. Um, it is a real meaningful problem and, and we've, we've made a, a significant dent in it. Um, it, nothing can stop when you have droughts like we have and, and and the current landscape. But over the last couple of years, we know that this has made a huge difference in, in, in that area. A second example would be from an industrial application. Uh, there was a near miss. So in the safety industry, if you had a, you know, a worker wasn't hurt, but almost was. So this is a very, very serious incident, like in, in oil and gas or in, in any industrial application. Um, so what would, 
the, the reason there was this near miss is there was a, some, some insulation, some sort of like cement cladding over a pipe and there was some corrosion and it fell off and it nearly bonked somebody on the head. So what would usually happen, you'd have to do a full shutdown and, and, and inspect the entire plant and, and, and the, send in the engineers. Well, we worked with an engineering firm that took video of the entire plant and then we used computer vision. We used a type of AI to better predict where there might be corrosion, where there might be a safety incident waiting to happen. So in this case, same type of thing, it saved thousands of hours in terms of that plant, in terms of how fast you could get things back up in operation, but more importantly, are reducing the number of potential safety instances that could happen. That's I, sure, I share both those examples because most of, the, most of what is going to happen in AI is these weird, really specific use cases that, you know... We know that Netflix is using AI. We know that ads are being targeted with AI. We know that autonomous driving is coming. But think about the rest of the economy. Anywhere where there's a business process, anywhere where a prediction is made, AI, artificial intelligence and machine learning can be used. And so we didn't necessarily come in to you know, our client here with the safety application. When we came in, we talked to the engineers. They said, hey, can we use you know, this AI to actually help us do our jobs better? And that, so that's where that co-development part of our business model really comes in, where you have to build together. And, and in the end, it's like, you know, we just got workers, you know, things back and, you know, workers safer and things back on track sooner than it would have been. Fascinating. Uh, and it, I think, does uh, suggest a huge opportunity. What can companies be doing then? What should companies be thinking about in regards to how they can make use of AI? Two things. Education and making little bets. So from an education point of view, we've talked about a bunch of these pieces. And when we talk about how large language models work and, and getting to ground truth or lack of ground truth with LLMs, you know, how many executives in the country do you think fully understand that? How many executives do you think fully understand the garbage in, garbage out, the bias side of, of AI? You know, as you explain it, you talk I think the vast it. majority of executives don't understand garbage in, garbage out in Excel models. I, as I see people- <laughs> well, that, even, even you know, worse. Take a look at models that come out of a computer. They believe they're true ra rather than realize all they are is a model and they got to go through and check the assumptions. So there, there's a, you know, there, there, there's an uptake both in terms of from the C-suite to, you know, in, within every business unit of every large organization to those on the front line. And, and so there's an education piece there that if we can all, there's an upskilling from that side of it, right? Um, and then second, I'd say, you know, we'd rather have, Ten hundred thousand dollar projects than one million dollar project, right? Where it was a few years ago, there would be like there would you know a CEO would say, "We need to just start doing some AI. We got some data. Go do that." You know, but to to make a project work, you need the data, but you need to have the return on investment. And so, AI is still very R and D heavy. We're still having this iterative, experimental approach, and so going in and being able to take a little bet and saying, hey, let's start a project and knowing that maybe our first one is not going to be perfect, but if we go down this road, it's going to increase the data literacy within the organization. You're going to have this educational component that's going to come and we're going to know what data we actually need to collect. Because everybody thinks they've got a bunch of data then they can just start using AI. For the vast majority of organizations, yeah, the data is garbage. Data is garbage. You've used but, a couple of different. But if you go in and you get the data science and say, "How could we actually improve this? What could we do to collect the right data?" Then that starts the flywheel. Then next quarter it's a little bit better. Next and next and next, right? So it's this continual. It because this affects every workflow and every process in your business, right? You need to commit completely, but you can do so by making a small bet and starting to learn. You used a couple of different terms. I just want to take a step back for a second, see if you can explain the difference. We've talked about chat GPT. You've talked about uh, LLMs, large language models. You've talked about AI and you've talked about generative AI. What's the difference between those, if you could? Yeah, great question. So, and, and again, for those comp, you know, comp side people on, on the call here, understand, I'm going to talk about this directionally correct and how a lay person should think about this versus a, a technical definition. Because if you listen to the academics, you, you just end up confused, right? For the average person. That's what I'm asking you. So 
Think of AI as this umbrella term that is so broad, it's almost meaningless. Like it's this catch-all, right, for all these underlying technologies. So we talk about machine learning. Machine learning is building something to be adapt without being explicitly programmed. And the biggest part of machine learning is deep learning. So it used to be you kind of said, okay, we've got AI and we've got machine learning and then deep learning, but then deep learning was kind of like taking over and becoming the biggest part of machine learning and machine learning was is becoming the biggest part of AI. And now you're seeing almost this overlapping, when, when we help teach us, there's this overlapping Venn diagram where you're using like ChatGPT in the back end is actually using deep learning. That's actually the big model, right? But it's using deep learning with another branch called natural language processing, NLP. So when it comes to the alphabet soup, just understand like, and, and you could sit here and you'd probably need 10 minutes to really go through with it. The average person doesn't need to know RL from ML to deep learning. Just understand that there's a whole bunch of different tools all fitting underneath this over underneath the umbrella. It's usually a type of machine learning. If I'm talking to a non-technical audience, I'll use the term AI. If I'm talking to my team and I use the term AI, they'll smack me if I use that because really what we're doing is machine learning. To generative AI. Generative AI is just any type of machine learning, any type of AI that's creating something new. So in the case of chat GPT or large language models, it's, it's spitting out text. It's having that conversation. But there's some really interesting stuff around images and video. So you'll hear terms like stable diffusion and mid journey or some of the sort of the brand names in that space. You're now seeing us saying, can we create an image based upon this? Can we get an AI? And, and sometimes it's amazingly good. Sometimes it's like shockingly gruesome. Um, Google... Google Will um, Will Smith eating meatballs, and you'll see it like it's almost like this. Like I didn't, it, it, it it's so close but so far away. So you've probably seen some of these images going around social yeah. media. So think of generative as just that side. So the large and large language models, you know, it it's 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 we're saying we we're training something on trillions of parameters. So it's almost hard to fathom. Like that's why these things are so expensive because they cost tens, hundreds of millions of dollars to build one model. So you'll set everything up and train it. And, and the amount of computing power to build these things is astronomical, which is part of the reason why OpenAI had that huge investment from Microsoft. Microsoft put in 10 billion. And uh, a lot of that is, is the compute power and, and, and the, the, the GPUs, the horsepower to actually make these things work. So AI umbrella term kind of doesn't mean anything, but that's what everybody uses. Everything else is different tools in the toolbox that are types of machine learning. And then of which the real sexy ones right now are deep learning and then how that's put together with natural language processing to create these large language models. So even after saying this, I mean, it, the average person is just going, okay, forget all I want to go try and chat GPT. That's what the average person is saying. Go, go, go what try it tells it. me you know about what? something or other. Yeah. And say, Hey, you know, here's, here's way less sexy. We're going to use data to optimize our business processes. <laughs> Right. That's all it is. But that's what uh, you're saying. Uh, also, we're just, we're, there's just all these tools in the toolbox, all these different branches. You're just optimizing processes. That's all it is. You're just using data to change the way we make decisions. That's all. But that's way less sexy. We're, we're chatting tonight with uh, Corey Jensen. We're going to take a final break and come back with some concluding comments in just two minutes. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour. I'm having a really interesting conversation tonight uh, with Corey Jensen about uh, ChatGPT, about uh, generative uh, artificial intelligence, about machine learning, deep learning, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Corey is the co-founder, co-CEO of a company by the name of Alta ML, which is a Canadian artificial intelligence scale-up that designs and implements applied AI solutions for businesses. As I mentioned earlier, I had the privilege of uh, hearing him speak at a conference, and he really, he really, I think... Um, Many everyone sit up and think about how AI is going to change their business and uh, and and how technology and uh, and ecosystems etc are going to change our cities. Uh, and I thought it was really a, a helpful uh, conversation, Corey. And so I uh, wanted to reach out to you and thank you very much for uh, coming on the show uh, today. Let me ask you, um, what do you think that uh, that we should be aware of as parents um, in regards to Chat GPT? Are you concerned? There's been a lot of people that. Are, are saying that there's an issue in regards to kids making use of chat GPT? Um, 
And let me answer that once during the, sort of for your audience during the uh, break we were talking about uh, what would ChatGPT say if it asked should I vote for this person or that person and and I asked that question about Justin here Brian and 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 actually to the credit of the good folks at OpenAI this is as an as an AI language model I don't have personal opinions or preferences whether you should vote for Trudeau or any other candidate depends on various factors, including your own political beliefs, values, and the specific policies and actions of that candidate. So they have put in the guardrails to make sure that it's not actually answering one way or another. Now, I, you know, you can also, they call it the sort of jailbreaking it. You can also really get it to say different things by giving it different prompts. There's a whole new field called prompt engineering and, and it's, it's getting into it. So there's been some big buzz around asking questions about one side of the political spectrum for the other. And why is one side only, you know, 50 words and the other side is 200 words. So anyway, but there's, there's a little bit of a nugget for, for, for that I think leads into your next question here of um, these large language models are going to impact so many things in our life. And, and frankly, they might be, they might be the way that we actually interact with our computers and our phones and every, I mean, to a large extent, we're already using, you don't realize it, but you're using natural language processing this NLP, this branch of AI, when you talk on your phone and say, hey, Google, I want to, you know, take me, you know, what are directions to downtown Toronto? Like, it's it's taking your voice and it's converting that to text and it's that's using machine learning. Now, ChatGPT, here's the most important thing I think for parents to know. And, and I don't want to, I don't want to tick off all your, your, you know, any educators that are on in your audience here, Brian, but the essay is dead. The essay as a mechanism for judging whether or not our kids have learned a subject, it, forget it. Sure, you can have kids sit with a pen. I mean, they don't even learn handwriting, in, at least in my kids' schools, right, anymore. And you can have them write it out. The point of an essay is to do that first draft, then let your brain marinate and think about it, to then get other feedback from it, to come back. Um, yes, high school kids have been cheating forever. But now... With these large language models, you're never going to be able to stop it. I don't care how many applications you build on the other side to try to detect whether something's been written by AI. What if we embraced these large language models as a tool to help transform the education system? So one thing I did with my daughter the other day is she needed her essay. I said, okay, well, let's use ChatGPT. That oh, I can just have my essay written, Dad? No. Let's have... Let's use ChatGPT to brainstorm. And her topic was, uh, I don't know, she's in grade 11. So it's like imperialism in colonial, I don't know. I, but we, we sort of typed in the essay topic, said, help me brainstorm the various topics that I should research to really understand this issue. And it was pretty good. Like it kind of came back with five or six areas that she should look at and go through. So just as I think that probably 40 years, 40, 50 years ago, people said we shouldn't be using these graphing calculators or we shouldn't be using computers. This is a tool that can help supercharge our kids' education. It's actually really exciting if you flip it and think about it that way. So I was interested just before uh, we started our interview, um, I got an email from The Economist magazine about a, uh, a guest article column written by a... Uh, uh, historian and philosopher Yervil Nora Harari, who is an Israeli, uh, who's written uh, incredibly interesting books, Homo Sapiens, Homo Deus, etc. Uh, and uh, he uh, he's written that. Um, uh, his book, books on my bookshelf, love and, them. And and the next one, Homo Deus, is even better than that. But uh, he posed the question: What would happen once a non-human intelligence becomes better than the average human at telling stories, composing melodies? drawing images, and writing laws and scriptures. The answer he believes casts a dark cloud over the future of human civilization. So that's one point of view. And then I mentioned that uh, I, I interviewed Murray Simpson, who uh, is doing, uh, a, it's a democracy channel called Citizen that uses chat GPT and, and, and polling to try to figure out the right answers to, to important questions. And he countered and said that this is the most important technological development since the Gutenberg Press. Which is it? Is it a dark cloud over the future of hum human civilization? Or is it the most important technological innovation since the Gutenberg Press? How would you answer that question with the atomic bomb? Well, we asked that question. And uh, and, and it depended, I think, on what it's used for. And, and some people could 
particularly given where the G7 is uh, being held, um, you know, it, 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 it obviously was unbelievably destructive um, yeah. and uh, cost a huge amount of human lives. Uh, but then it also could be uh, the solution for taking smog out of Ontario as it closed down coal plants and and can power the oil sands to pro- to, to produce hydrogen. So, you know, good and bad, depending uh, uh, on the user. I, so, so uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe dodge your question by saying that I'm just a, I'm just a translator. Uh, you know, we have one of the largest data science teams in the country and I work with in this in the field, they call it the AGI. What you're describing here is artificial and general intelligence. When it kind of, and then the 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 super intelligence, where we work and we play is called narrow AI. So we're looking, trying to solve very specific problems. We're trying to make predictions in one area because to date, what you're describing is not here, and maybe that'll come in five years, ten years, thirty years. So what they Ray Kurzweil calls a singularity, uh, when when the AI surpasses or exceed surpasses human, uh, uh, and, and but right now, even though you think the large language model, it seems like it's thinking, it actually doesn't understand it. We can debate it whether it rationalizes at all. It, it's still pretty dumb, and so it's still coming down the road. I will leave that question for the philosophers. I mean, Elon Musk and Bill Gates and 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 all these ones are all kind of chiming in. Um, I, if, if anybody really wants to see the other side of it, the non-dystopian view, Yann LeCun, again, a great Canadian who, one of those Nobel laureates we mentioned earlier, his Twitter feed, he'll, and, and, and he, I would say that there's probably more academics on the side of pushing for this, the dystopian future, but it, I guess as a practical question, can you, can you put the cat back in the bag? Like once this is out, like it, and and that gets these letters like from a practical point of view, can you really stop this development? I mean, can we? When has humanity ever just agreed to just stop? All? Or well, when have we ever agreed to do anything in unison? I mean, and 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 whether you want to talk about climate change or vaccines or any of these, listen, you've been the most difficult interview I think I've ever had. Usually, I get to talk about the fun stuff. You're hitting me with all the hard societal questions, right? Which uh, you know, frankly, I'm just a I'm just a dumb entrepreneur who's not equipped to really. I can give you my opinion, but uh, it, the value is exactly what you paid for it. So I do think that at least having the discussion is important when it comes to AI and understanding um, that this is going to impact everything that I, I would, coming back to technology terms, everybody should view, I would propose you view ChatGPT as the Netscape moment for AI. For, the, for those younger listeners, Netscape was a browser that came out three or four browsers ago, like in the mid 90s. Uh, But that was the first time there was a graphical browser where people could see the potential for this new communications network known as the internet. Now, Netscape didn't invent the internet, you know, but it it was a great product that put it in a way that exposed what was possible. In the same way, like OpenAI through ChatGPT, many would argue didn't necessarily, didn't now say, they didn't invent deep learning, they didn't invent reinforcement learning, which is in the front end. It's brilliant, brilliant product engineering. They've done something that, frankly, that organizations with way more resources couldn't. So it's a fabulous technical achievement, but I would say it's more akin to Netscape in that and saying, now we've exposed what might be possible. And now it's a matter of having those discussions and policymakers, the private sector and academia need to all come together and hopefully find the positive solution because there are as many reasons to be optimistic as there are reasons to believe in the apocalypse and okay and so so while we can have an interesting conversation about dystopian futures or a cop apocalypse or technological change or something like that the key for most of the people probably listening today is how does it impact their life and what should they do so from a, a business person in edmonton or toronto what should they do just look at how we can apply it in our business Oh, and and let's let's not throw it back. Yeah, let's uh, listen. Any, for a business person, I'd, I'd say leaning in and, and and being able to educate yourself and make a small bet. Try to figure out how to start working. With either maybe there might be some projects that you could work in that you could start utilizing and building into your business. Maybe there's some things that you could do depending on the size of your organization. Start building your own machine learning internally. Um, but understanding that this is, if, if you believe that this is as impactful as the internet itself. If you buy my argument there, then if if this were you back in 1996, 1997, what would you have done differently? 
when we have these mass technical technological changes, it means we need to, to kind of lean in and no one's got all the answers necessarily. But if you know you've got a mega trend, understanding how that impacts your industry could be one of the most important decisions or most important strategic decisions you make for you know, the future of your business over the next five to 10 years. Corey Jensen, thanks so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. You've been uh, uh, very interesting, thought-provoking, and uh, and I encourage you to keep uh, investing in those Canadian startups because hopefully we can keep some of them in Canada and uh, employ lots of people and make huge successes of them. Will do. Thanks very much for having me. That's our show for tonight, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Good night.